Holiness is not something that you cannot have accomplished in your life here on earth. That has to be absolutely clear, and you have to be convinced of that. If holiness is something so big and so extreme, so dramatic, and it is, but if that is the picture of the entire picture of holiness, um, you and I will somehow put it in a distance and make it think, and we, are, we convince ourselves that we'll never be able to have holiness in our lives. That is really, really important to see that. Um, we have to be very clear with that thought, that holiness is something that God expects from us. It is something that has been a provision has been made to bring us to that point where God can declare that we are holy people. Now, I look in the Old Testament and I see that it is not that people said themselves that they were holy. However, God later on in the New Testament, He spoke through Paul, and He talked about how that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to prophesy and to speak forth the word of truth which we have here in our hands. He declared them as holy people. And so the understanding of holiness, I believe, is really, really important that we get the picture very clear. You see, often when we look at the word holy, we think of the seraphims that were around the throne, and we think of the four, um, the, the four beasts and the 24 elders, that they had their faces down, they covered their faces, the seraphims did, with two wings they covered their faces and their feet, and then with two they flew. And we think somehow our response to His holiness should be the same way. When the fact of that is it doesn't work that way. You know, it's not really that way for us in human flesh to stand before, here on earth, to stand somewhere and just say, holy, 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 holy God. And you really, when you're really honest with yourself, you don't feel that. You don't feel that holiness. But in heaven, that truth was revealed to where it caused them to fall to their, their faces and to put their faces down. And when I say God is holy and He's a holy God and we should not be able to walk, we should all lay flat on the face. It's not being realistic. It's not being realistic. In heaven, there was no more flesh to drag along. The people now, the beasts and, and the elders were glorified. It's a different story. Our experience in holiness is not the same as what they experienced there. And we need to have an understanding in that. If we do not have an understanding in that, we will not even look at holy, holiness and thinking that there is a slight possibility that somehow God could look at my life and our lives and say that you are a holy man of God. And for that, our thinking has to be clear. It has to be truthful. We have to have an understanding. Now, having said what I just did, I did not diminish at all of the holiness of God. But the perception of us here on earth to look at the holiness of God who He is in relation to us here needs to be ultimately understood and not confused. Do you hear me? That cannot be confused. And I would like to say this, that when God says, when the Bible says that without holiness you will not see God, I have heard of people that strive because they have a problem loving someone else. Holiness doesn't enter into that picture, does it? I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say that I've struggled with holiness. You don't hear that term that way. And so defining holiness needs to be a, a defining that has to be understood on a human level. And we need to get it clear. And that's what I will try to do in these messages and the one this evening as well. Again, the title is Holiness the power of separation. Holiness ultimately is just that. You see, God is completely holy. God is completely separated from anything else that's out there. Satan brings no 
absolutely no influence to him. God is not tempted at all with anything that Satan offers. There is complete separation between those two. And the fallen angels and anything evil that is out there, God is not tempted with it. God is completely divided and separated from it. That is what holiness is. Now, the word holy means, and I'm starting where I kind of left off the last Sunday. Holiness, the word holiness means to cut. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> do you notice something? <clears throat> Excuse me. We have here in the front of the pulpit down here, and I believe this as well. I think so. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I know that is, is, is cedar of Lebanon. The wood there in the front that you see, that's cedar of Lebanon. For some reason, it's not growing. That was a tree that was kind of old because look at the white boards. And it had a lot of age to it, and it grew and it grew, but it's not been growing since it's been put there. You know why? It's been cut off. This is in part the picture of holiness. Holiness means to cut. Something in your life that was attached, perhaps, of your past problems that you struggle with or the old man is cut from something and it's not continue. He is not continue to progress in the life. Sin was cut off and it doesn't drag on, doesn't drag on. It doesn't find prosperity in your life. That was wood and the wood we see around here. You know, if it wouldn't have been cut, this thing would be wobbling and it would continue to grow. We come to church, if every two by four that was used in this building throughout, we come to church and 10 years from now, the thing would be way up there. But it's been cut. And when it's cut, it's cut. No growth, no nothing goes in there to feed, to feed it anymore. This is what holiness is. There is nothing that is feeding God. He is entire. He is himself. He is holy. He's separated from all the nutrients that are out there in the world that would want to defeat him. He is totally separated from that. And when these 24 elders and the four beasts, when they saw that separation, the power of who he was, they, just, they fell on their faces and they saw that truth. Part of the picture of that holiness is at one time there was a lot of sin in my life. There was a lot of sin in your life. It's not been able to prosper. It's done. It's been cut off. It was cut. It's not going on. It's, in fact, there's other things happening. The life and the truth that God has given to us is now growing and growing and abounding in our lives. It's part of holiness. It's part of holiness. It means to consecrate, to sanctify. Then I wrote on here, what I said in the beginning, let us declare as the redeemed of the earth who he is. And this is something that we need to do. I don't know that I ever come in the presence of God at home when I pray that I do not, first of all. And I remember that I heard somebody years ago saying that we should be doing this kind of thing, that you should, first of all, you come with thanksgiving, then you bless the Lord, and then you praise the Lord and all this before we enter into his presence. I don't work on that anymore. It's become natural to me because of the understanding that he's given me of who he is. So the first thing that I do when I come in the presence of God is I feel unworthy. Who am I on this earthly, on this earth with a clay lips and a vessel of clay that can say, God, I approve you. Who are you that I approve him? But he needs to hear that. I approve of your salvation. I approve of your forgiveness. I bless you for making the provision. I thank you for all those things that you have done to make final provisions for my entire life, to keep me into the eternities to come that I will be totally safe. Thank you for that provision. I bless you for that provision. I approve of that. That's part of praise. We think praise is, Lord, I praise you, I praise you. For what? Well, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. But for what? I praise him for who he is. We need to name that. If you want... To be personal with God, you start doing those things. And I believe this is part of who he is in his entirety of holiness. Now, I now want to go to Romans 12. You don't have to turn to it. It's a quick verse that I've spoken about for years. I notice 
that when holiness starts in our life, it starts with a, one specific word or work, and that's the knife. Somehow, the knife, the cutting off of something in my life, is where the holiness starts. We start in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice. There it goes. There is the knife. There is the sacrifice. There is the death. A complete sacrifice. What's the next word? Holy and acceptable to God. The sacrifice, now the holy. The sacrifice, what is a sacrifice? It's a cutting off. There is nothing that they brought and sacrificed on the altars of old. All the years that they've done that, for several thousand years, there was not one of them that was laid on the altar without the knife. The knife was first, and then it was called holy in the eyes of God. So when God says that when we bring ourselves as a sacrifice to Him, that's the beginning of holiness. It's not in a certain article that you wear or don't wear. Holiness is when the knife hits my life, when the sacrifice is placed on the altar. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, which now is acceptable unto God. You see, without holiness, you will not see God. Sacrifice, pre presentation of yourself, present yourself on the altar. What's the next thing? Now God calls it holy. You take any shortcuts in that, you will not have holiness. You will not be separated. We need to be separated from our own ways, our own ideas, our own imaginations, our own interpretations of the Bible. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray, every, astray, everyone has turned unto his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The whole thing that God is looking for in our life, in my life, is that my own way gets placed on the altar and that I will only pick up his way. That's the beginning of holiness. It's the beginning of separation. It's the beginning of old things passed away, and behold, all things become new. This is holiness. Now, I want to... I had a real tough time trying to decide what I need to bring out today or tonight on this message as a continuation and I, I had a whole list of people that I wanted to look to for examples of the Old Testament, and I basically couldn't get away from just one of them. So I'm just going to use one of them in this evening's message on one example of holiness and what it cost and what it was from start to finish. And we just want to look at this. I'll mention several other people that enter into the picture as well. But first of all, this is what was required. Back in Genesis about chapter, I uh, don't have it right. Yeah, I believe Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, God spoke to Abraham, and he gave him the promise. But after he gave him the promise, there was a condition he had to meet. And this is the condition that he had to meet. Bring some gift and lay it before me. And here is what the gifts were. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 8, it says like this. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now, what is the problem here is this is simply God gave the promise to Abraham, and he told him that you will have children like the stars in the heavens and the sand of the sea, seashore. You will have children like this. And then Abraham questioned, he said, God, how do I know this is from you? How do I know that this will be so? And then God said, here is the condition. You meet this condition and go in covenant with me, and then I'm in covenant with you. When I'm in covenant with you and you're in covenant with me, what I say as the Father is going to happen. Now, if you're not going to be in covenant with me, then I cannot do that. But I, you have to enter into covenant with me. And for that, we need a knife. And this is what happened. Genesis 15, verse 8. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit the promises that you've given me? Now, I want you to see this in your own life concerning promises. There are some of you people that are hanging on to promises because 
you feel and you believe that God spoke to you about certain promises, but you've not received them yet. Some of that in part can be because you've not entered into covenant with him. You see, God made the statement, and he gave the promise, but there was a condition on Abram to receive it, and that was a covenant that had to be made. And a covenant that had to be made had to have a knife. It had to have holiness, which is a separating of something of his life. God had to separate the thoughts, the ideas, the ambitions, and all those things that Abraham had. He had to separate that from his own self-life and bring him into the ambitions, if I can call it that, of God, the ways of God, the thoughts of God, what God had said. And for that to happen, man had to die. Now, I had in mind to go back to the Garden of Eden and speak about Adam and Eve when they fell. They did just the opposite. They walked out of the covenant, and then they became dead, according to the Bible. They died. There was death that took a hold of them because they walked out of the covenant. God told them, do not eat of the tree, and they did. That stopped the covenant that they had with God. So let's read this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 8. And I have to speed up so I can get through this message. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Verse 9. And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and he laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, that it was dark, and behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Now, we want to identify this a little bit. Let's look at what was the things that God demanded Abraham to bring as a sacrifice. God said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to bring a heifer. I want you to bring a she-goat. I want you to bring a ram and a ring dove and a nestling. Now, I looked that up in Hebrew, and that's how it interprets. A ring dove is like a mourning dove, something close to that. has a certain ring around the neck that you see it when you see the picture. I looked it up. And then a nestling is a young little pigeon, which it's called a pigeon at that point. In other words, a mother and its little baby, that's what it is. Now, I want you to divide all those, but not the last two. So the commandment was like this. Take a heifer. Now, the word heifer is interpreted in Hebrew as an unbroken older female calf. When I say an older calf, three years old. It is about the time where it would start to reproduce. About that time when it's just ready to really start what the intention of that heifer would be. I want you to take that, and I want you to take that and sacrifice it. And this sounds a little gory, but I'm going to say it just as it was. I want you to take a knife and take it right down the center from over top of the head right down to the spine and sever the spine right down the middle and lay the sides apart from each other. Get the picture? Look at that picture. It says, lay the sides apart. There it lay, two sides to one animal. Soon as you have done that, take a she-goat. Now, the word she-goat here is a domesticated goat. It is one that has been tamed. It's not one that is out in the wild, but it's one that has learned and learned and learned, and it became a tamed animal. Uh, we've tried that, haven't we? We've pretty much tamed our lives. We've pretty much got things the way we want it. We've pretty much learned some things. Okay, this is what he says. Take that and do the same thing. Take a knife and take it right down the middle and lay that apart from each other. Then he did that. And then the next one was the ram. And the ram is interpreted as a strong male goat. That's the nature, the old nature and the power of its old nature, mustering stuff up so get her done. I can do it. I'll do anything. Nothing will stop me. Take that, separate right down the nerve system. There's nothing more touchy 
In an animal as a whole, or in a human as a whole, of course you have the brain, but the connection of the spine, go right down to the middle of that spine and separate that. Now the last two things that I want you to lay on the one side and the other on the other side is take the ring dove which is the type, according to what I read here, was the friendship and love to what it produces. It's the friendship and love that the mother has for the little nestling. It protects it. It hatched it. Now it sits there and protects it and protects it. And if an enemy or something come, because it's the reproductive in part. It's what I have done. It's the good that has produced out of, out of me. All the things that I, I want you to separate that. I want you to separate your good works from who you are and lay that right in the same place. And once he did that, it says, when evening was come, there's a horror of darkness that Abraham felt after he saw all those pieces lay there. There lay the heifer, there lay the he, uh, he goat, there lay the, the, uh, the ram or the she goat and the ram and now the birds. Now they, they're there. And in the evening... As the sun was going down, he just felt this, ooh, I don't know. I feel really, this, it's like death around me. And then he saw a smoking furnace. It says a burning furnace comes right down the middle of it. Now, when you interpret that in Hebrew, uh, a furnace is not what we think. When we think of a furnace, we're thinking the furnace of our house. It's a place where we gas in and so forth. They didn't have furnaces like that. It was more of a pot, great big kettle, and they had fire in it. It was that type of a furnace. He saw that big kettle come right down to there with a burning fire came right down to the middle of that spine. And after that, then also it was a smoke. What does it say here again? A smoking furnace and a burning lamb came right down the middle of And it was at that point when the furnace and the lamb passed through the center of the spine, through the nerve system of whatever lay there, as a type of the human being, giving ourselves completely to God for His service, for His work. And when that happens, when we're cut right down the spine, nothing lives. And that's where He comes, and He brings His fire into it. The smoking furnace and a burning lamp walk right through there. And let me tell you that I have experienced that in my life. I did not see a furnace, but I knew a furnace went down through my life. I know and I remember when that happened. I remember when God changed my life like that, where the power of God and the life of God came into me. It was at that point where I laid it all in front of him. And at that point now, Abraham was in covenant with God. You see, any shortcuts will not put you in covenant with God. This is the reason why so many people do not get answered prayer, because they have not separated their good deeds from who they are, their good works, as the turtle dove and the nestling, and also the heifer part, the goat part, and the ram part of our lives. You could say the, the soul, body, and spirit. You could say the emotion, the will, and the intellect separate it then also from its works. These things have to come to a place of death. Only at that point is where holiness enters into the picture. When man is put out of commission and God starts his mission. It's a sudden place. It's a specific place in life. And I think some of you have experienced that. I know some of you have experienced that. This is where holiness starts. It's where if I can say it this way, it's where our own growth hormone has no more part in us. It stops. It's the, wor the work and ways of God that is doing things through our lives. Our own selfishness, our own ambitions, our own ideas, our own whatever we can get done, where that stops, where it's cut right down the middle and it's lay apart, laid apart, and said, God, I've given myself... Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? Body, the goat nature, the heifer nature, the ram nature, that thing. Present it to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Then it becomes acceptable. God will accept that. 
Then he'll walk right down the middle. And once he's going through the middle, he's in covenant. And until you've done that, he will not be in covenant. And let me tell you this. I believe some of you have come close to it, but you're not in covenant. You're not in covenant. What happens when things die away from you and, and you're not able to continue or to produce what maybe you did before, all at once you get concerned. And you remember, there was two things that were not separated. The, the turtle dove and the nestling were not split in half. They were just separated from each other and killed that way. That's what wants to pick up. It's like a man once said. He said he, he knows there's something like the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he says, you know what? I've seeked the Lord, and I've read every book I could find on it, but it didn't happen to me, so I decided I can't sit around and wait. I'm going to go do the Lord's work anyways. That's not in covenant with God. That's not how it, how it works. You have to come to a place where you're in covenant with God, and that demands an absolute death. That's the beginning of holiness. Now, when we look at heaven, when we look at God, this is the picture we have in the heavens before the throne of God. This is the picture of God. He is entirely himself. He is not, he's not getting strength from anyone else. He is not influenced by anything else. He is entirely, he is entirely him. He is God. He is Jehovah. He is God Yahweh. He is God Elohim. He is God Adonai. He is God Nisai. And all those other words. That is entirely who he is. If we would not be, he would still be the same God. He will not change. He cannot change. That's who he is. He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. This is what God demands of us. Any shortcuts of this, may I tell you again, any shortcuts of this is not good enough in the eyes of God. You want to bring other gifts and other things to make him happy and to please him, it doesn't work that way. He will only walk with a, with a smoking furnace. As a smoking furnace and as a lamb, he will only walk through once our life has been separated unto him. Only then are we in true covenant with him. Now, the difference again between the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. We walk in that one day and the next day we don't. We're tempted to walk away from it. Absolutely. That is the difference, as Derek Prince has said, the difference between a living sacrifice and a dead sacrifice of old is a living sacrifice continues to live. I surrender, but it wants to come right back off. I have to keep it there every day, every day, every day. That's how holiness works. Let's look at some other things. I just wrote some notes here. A fire pot and burning lamp went right down the middle of the nerve system of function. Even the best of mankind at times has, and listen to this, even the best of us, the best of you that are sitting here, that spent the most time in prayer, that read the most Bible, the best and the best and the best, if you want to call it that, have elements of controversy and strive and envy and unkindness at times. The preachers are not exempt from that. There's elements that are in our lives at times that want to make these things and bring these things about. At times, we even carry personal dislikes against someone. Our natural man will always sit at the, the, on the outside of the door waiting for a welcome to come in. And the natural man always sits, also sits in the inside of the door waiting to suggest anything he can. He is always ready to come to our aid when we turn away from God and surrender. Holiness is being separated from our natural man, from our carnal man, and to walk in the Spirit. That is holiness. I wrote down some things here. I think I, I'm a better writer than I'm a speaker. Our natural man always sits at the door on the outside or even on the inside waiting to find his place in situations to hurt or torment or even embellish an attitude within, flaring up the imagination of the heart. I have, I know that picture. I know that picture. All at once, there's something makes you question something. You might have heard something a little bit. And there's something that just wants to step up the old man within or without, wanting to come in and, and embellish something, just make something bigger and bigger and work as a fever of sickness, 
to try to bring attack or to have ill will or some kind of element that influences us against God. Rudiments of defeat and struggle and resentment and spiritual bile. Even the poison of asps can be under our lips at times. The most godly of them all can be affected by this if, he, if they do not separate themselves from the carnal man. And the temptation to always welcome the carnal man and the natural man in will produce just that. Isaiah knew this when he had a vision of seeing God. And he said, the first thing that he said was, in Isaiah 6, 3, he said, He heard the seraphims crying one to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, meaning the army of spiritual soldiers. And the whole earth is full of his glory or splendor. And then he said, Woe is me. He said, I am undone. I see these elements within me. I see these problems that I walk with sometimes. And he said, I'm undone. And you know, the people that I'm around have the same tendencies. He saw God's holiness of separation from all of that, from bad attitudes, from ill will, from ill feelings, from suspicion. God doesn't have suspicion. God doesn't have opinion. I remember that years ago when God showed me that I don't have an opinion. I see it all. It's clear. So you don't need an opinion. The only time you have an opinion is if you can't see. And that's enough to not put confidence in opinion. As the old man wants opinions, it's what I think is important. It's not what I think is important. It's what he says is important. It's not based on what I think. It's not based on what I feel. It's not based on any inclination that I have. It's based entirely on the Word, on the truth. And to separate yourself from that to the truth is where holiness starts. In Ezekiel, or Exodus, chapter 3, verse 1, I want to look some more in Moses here, some more of the things about Moses. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Jethro was the, was the priest of Midian. Now this was over in Saudi Arabia, what is known today as Saudi Arabia. Lord willing, in, in several weeks from now, we'll be able to see Saudi Arabia with our own eyes again. And he led the flock on the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. So this is what happened. He was near the mountain of God. This is called the mountain of God. This same mountain... I've seen that mountain in the distance. I saw the top of it. It's called the mountain of God in the Bible. It's the same mountain that Elijah, when Jezebel was after him, he ran for that mountain. He needed to hear from God, so he ran to the mountain of Hora, which is about a three-day journey from where Elijah was from Carmel down to there. And he looked, and this is what it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Moses saw this in the middle of the night somehow, or maybe it was in the daytime, but it was somehow in a time frame. And he saw this, and he said, Ha! Huh, there's a fire over here. And if you know anything about the desert, you don't see that. There's nothing, no plants there. But here was a bush, and it was on fire. I believe it was probably quite big. Uh, probably a uh, acacia wood tree that you just find very, very scarce. That's about the only thing you'll find. And there it was as a bush. And that's the way they looked. And it was burning on fire. And it said, look at this. God was watching Moses now. And he saw this out of the corner. And then he turned his face. And then he started walking toward it. And God said, stop. Don't come near. Just watch the verse, what it says. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. And when the, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God spoke to him. It's the difference again. 
Sometimes we go through life and something gets our attention, but we don't turn toward it. It's an act of God. Something happened, it was clear that God had his hands and his finger in this thing. He knew that, but until he turned toward it, God didn't speak to him. But when he turned, then God spoke. It got his attention enough to where he turned, and God said, now stay there. That is a message entirely on its own. Why did God not want him to come closer? Look what it says. It's a, this is not the answer to it, but this is the whole meaning of having a bush on fire. Verse 4, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush of fire and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, I'm here, or here I am. You see, verse 5 it says, And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off the shoes of your feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now you look at the history of this man Moses. He was born, he was swimming along the Nile River, and then a, because they, he was supposed to be a dead little boy, there was a command made by the king, the pharaoh, and he ended up in Pharaoh's house by somebody that came to get him, found him crying, and he came and took him home. It was Pharaoh's daughter. And there he was raised up in a king's home. And the next thing he did is God started speaking to him because he was a Hebrew, which this would be an Arab land, and Egypt would be the Arabs, and here was a Hebrew child. That's kind of a no-no. But what happens here, he had a call on his life to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt back into Canaan to overtake the Canaanites that had settled with the cities, as, as I've spoken already before to you. Now what happens here is in the midst of this calling, somehow he went and he messed up when he saw the calling he had on his life. God saw that he's not prepared. He went and he killed an Egyptian, and now he runs into the desert. And he runs over there for 40 years in preparation. And at the end and final time of the 40 years that he was there, here comes this bush that was on fire. And what it seems to me, and, and I, I hope somebody can understand this, but in the midst of the trial of running away from his original calling and God's further preparation for his service to be here on earth, to lead several million people through a dry, ugly desert for 40 long years where there was no water, there was no food, there was nothing to eat, he had to prepare this man in a spiritual sense. Because a non-spiritual person could never survive in that desert. I can tell you by way of experience, I walked, my son and I, we walked in a desert just like that for about two hours. And I thought for a while, I'm going to die. I really did. I questioned whether I'm going to come out of this desert. The temperature was 120, and this was in the summertime. And in Saudi Arabia, it would get even warmer. The temperatures were so absolutely extremely high. All I know is it said 120. That's as high as my thermometer went. And I drank like over two liters of water in two hours' time. And I ran out of water. My son gave some to me, and we were, we were done. We were empty. We could see where we're, hitting the, we're going to hit the road just over several of these little hills yet. I was afraid. I, I, I thought, you know what? I might not make it out of here. It was like a terror that gripped me. Moses man, this Moses man that was in a little, in a little boat, in a little bit of a whatever it was, just a tiny little bundle wrapped up in a little thing that swam, had a calling upon his life to deliver several million people through deserts that I just described. And for that, you've got to be spiritual. You've got to depend on something that your eyes can't see. You've got to depend on something that you cannot hear by your ears. It has to be a journey of miracles. And for that, there had to be separating. So he took him back in the desert for 40 years, and there he waited and waited and waited and waited. And one night, God spoke to him, and he said, Moses, You've been back here in this desert for 40 years. Don't come closer to me. Take your shoes off. You have no idea, but you're on holy ground. Now, I want to speak a little bit about that a little bit more, perhaps just a little bit later. 
God's people are wholly separated from man's traditions and practices and formalities. This is something that we find a lot of security in at times. God moved in a certain way, and we want to do it again. God moved 20 years ago in a certain way. We want to continue to hang on to that. That's not how it works. We have to be separated unto God continually. He said, do not draw closer, but take the shoes off of your feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moses, if I could tell you in another way that the beginning... You have now prepared yourself, and where you start now is not going to be dependent on the shoes that you've been wearing. It'll be dependent on something completely different. Where was Moses when the angels spoke to him? Where was he when he saw this? He was in the mountain of God, the Bible says. The mountain of God. Now, it would really be good, and I will not be able to spend that. I can't spend time, but it would really be good to go back into the part in the book of Revelation, and hopefully maybe the next message I might be able to do more of this, to go back into where the Bible talks about in the holy mountains of God. He talks about the different types of horses that were up in the mountains and the different types of things that were seen in the holy mountains of God. It also says that Lucifer was in the holy mountains of God. This was the mountain of God. There's a declaration of almost the identical thing in, about the mountains around Jerusalem. Mount Moriah has been declared. Some of those have been a certain declaration that, that God gave on those mountains as well. The whole point of that is concluded in our New Testament in Hebrews chapter 22, or 12, verse 22, where it says, But ye are not come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. The Bible says that we're not going to the mountain of God back in, in the Mount of Horeb in Saudi Arabia. That's not the mountain where God is dwelling on right now, but the mountain that God is dwelling on is Mount Zion, it's the church of the living God where there's a lot of angels around them. This is the place, the church of Jesus Christ is the place where God dwells now. This is known as the mountains of God. Do you understand that? The mountains of God, some of them maybe six feet tall, some five feet tall, some shorter, some taller, little mountains of God where God is doing His work. He's calling it the city of God is calling it Mount, uh, uh, Mount Zion with an S. God is looking to the church. God is looking to manifest His glory, His fire, His life, and His power on these mountains. Do you understand where the Bible says that if you speak to this mountain, it can be cast into the sea? Do you understand that we are to speak to the mountains? I've preached about that before in declaring God's work and God's truth to mountains. Look at the verse again. Hebrews 12, 22. But ye are come unto Mount, mountain of Zion, with an S, Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the innumerable company of angels. We are part of that. This is where God has placed us. He has not placed us in horror. He's placed us in the church. He's placed us with the saints. He's places where God is dwelling, where God is working. Hallelujah. This is part of the picture. Now, the picture, you cannot get it entirely until you see that other message on the different mountains and where the beasts and the different colors and the different speckled, the speckled horses and the and the solid, the white, and the black, and all those. And we will, Lord willing, get into some of that. Exodus chapter 4, verse 2, And the Lord said unto him, What is that is in thine hand? So here it comes. God said, Okay, I want you to go and talk to Pharaoh, and I want you to lead the children of Israel out of the, uh, out of the hand of slavery under Pharaoh. Now remember, this Pharaoh would have been probably his dad. I'm thinking that way, his adopted dad. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? He said, Well, they won't believe if I go and say, Hey, I'm, 
ask you to come. Take these several million people and let them come this way. God, because God spoke to me. He said, they're not going to believe me. And he said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, what is in your hand? And he said, um, it's a rod. He said, throw it down. Turn into a snake. And the thing, and he jumped back. It says, and Moses fleet from it. And God said, go pick it up, but pick it up by the tail. There's a lesson in this. You see, when the rod is picked up by the tail, the mouth is at the other end, and it becomes power. But when you choke it at the mouth, when you choke it at the head, it's not going to be the power of God in it. Now, I want to speak some more on this. I want you to see some more pictures of this. Verse 3, and he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. Verse 4, and the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. And the tail of the serpent is now the rod. There's a lot of people that try to do the work of God by taking a hold of the head. The rod will only be a rod in your hand of power when you have it by the tail. The head belongs to God, the tail belongs to you. The tail is the back end of a stick. Most of the time, we want to use the front, the mouth, and we want to argue our points, and we want to convince our points. We want to speak and be persuasive and all those kinds of things to win an argument. God says the power is held by the tail, never the head. It's later on in the picture. Let me see, I think I cut that out. Later on in the picture, you see that these rods came in the presence of the, of the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the sorcerers of Pharaoh. And they threw the rod down, and it turned into a serpent. And then Pharaoh called his, I believe it was Janus and Chambers, he called them in, and they went and took their rods and threw them down, and they turned into snakes as well. But what happened here is Aaron's rod now goes and swallows up the other rods, or serpents then. It opened its mouth and it ate the other serpents. Now Aaron walks around the rest of his life with the rod in his hand. What was inside the rod? The enemy's rod. This is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He took the enemy and he swallowed it up, making an open show and triumphing over the enemy and exposing the whole thing. The rod that Aaron carried around had eaten other serpents that were bad serpents. They would have, they, they turned to a serpent that would bite. But when Aaron had a hold of the tail of that, the other serpents couldn't do anything. It was contained inside that rod itself. When you try to use the head of the power that you have, whether it's persuasion, whether it's the carnal man, whatever formula that you use, understand what I'm saying? It will defeat you unless you carry it by the tail. There's a vast difference between walking around in theology and logic and these types of things, we want to use the head. We want to use the head to figure this thing out. God says, it's been figured out. All you need to do is believe. Just believe the word and it becomes power to you. Amen. We carry the rod by the tail. Yes. Do you understand that? I, I think it's... I think some of you see a little bit. And hopefully in another message, it's almost 9 o'clock, I have to come to a, a, an end here. Hopefully in another message I can speak a little clearer, perhaps, what all is in that serpent, what all is in that rod. Remember, that was the rod that was then put in the Ark of the Covenant. It was the rod that bought it. I believe it was the same rod. The rod, when it's held by the tail will swallow up other arguments of any type. But if you have it by the head, it'll bite you. It'll hurt you. It's part of the separation of holiness. 
It's not my concepts. It's not my ideas. It's not my opinions. It's not based on any of that. All has to be surrendered and carried around by the tail, and it becomes power to you. It was that same rod that Moses put out over the Red Sea, and it parted. Moses used it in other places, that same rod that he had that was at one point a serpent, but he carried it in his hand by the tail, and it became power to him. There's a big difference between taking a head, taking a hold of it by the head or the tail. Now, I actually wanted to bring um, a cane along tonight, and I wanted you to see in demonstration, I simply forgot, to take a rod and turn it upside down and walk around like that and see what it, all, what it does. It represents something completely different. The typical rod back in those days would have been kind of fat on the bottom and skinny on top which is the typical way you carry a rod. This was turned just the other way. The thin part was down, or the, the thin part was up, and the fat part would have been down. It's symbolic of a lot of things. Let's leave that, and let's go down through some more verses, and we'll just close for tonight. I feel I'm halfway through, and, and I'm working to get out what I have. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 2, And Moses called unto all, unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all the Lord, what the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, and unto Pharaoh, and unto all the servants, and unto all his land. He said this at the parting. He, he was coming. What had happened here? They went from Saudi Arabia, now the Arabian desert, and they were heading north, and they went through Edom, and then went all the way up to the city of Heshbon. And I'm not sure is that what we have here or not? I've tried to figure out what that picture was. I don't know that if it's Heshbon, but it, it could look like Heshbon. They went up to Heshbon, and God said, don't go any further, but turn back a little bit, and then come down to Nebo, then cross back over. All right? And before that all happened, Moses wanted a final talk yet with the children of Israel. And this is what he said. And Moses called unto all Israel, and he said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt and unto Pharaoh and unto all his servants and unto all this land. Verse 3, the great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs, those great miracles. Remember, Israel, remember how we crossed the Red Sea? Remember how that water came out of a rock and gave you all water when you were so thirsty? Remember that God fed you for 40 years, corn would not grow. No, there was no fruit. There was nothing that that desert grew. I fed you, and it was a constant daily miracle. I want you to hear this, brothers and sisters. There was a constant everyday miracle that God did to sustain the children of Israel in the desert. And I believe this is one of the main points of this whole message that I'm coming to right now. All these things... They experienced the miracles. They've seen the miracles, the mighty works that God did. Now I'll read that verse again. Ye, the great temptations which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles. Verse 4, yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. You have walked in the midst of these miracles. God has fed you right off of his hands, but you still can't see. You said, we saw these miracles. We were sustained by these miracles. We escaped Egypt by these miracles, but our eyes are still closed. We still can't see. Moses is saying, look at it. Do you get it? Israel, do you get it? You proud to rejoice. And you remember the song that you and Miriam sang when you got on the other side of the Red Sea, when you had wrote that song about the horse and the armies were dumped into the sea and how God prevailed all the great things, but you still cannot see something that I'm trying to tell you. You're still missing the whole point of what I'm wanting to do with you, Israel. You've experienced the mercy. You've experienced forgiveness. You've experienced the great things. Some of the greater miracles in the Bible, you were part of it. But you've come to the end of the trip. Your eyes are still closed. Your ears you cannot hear. You still have not perceived what God is trying to tell you. 
Think of that. Forty years of wandering in a desert, not knowing where to turn, not knowing what to do. And then God did a miracle, and God did a miracle, and they sat there and slept through the whole thing. I'm speaking to you tonight. I'm speaking to you. You have seen miracles. You have seen miracles in this church. Do you get it? Do you perceive what God's saying? What is he saying? Let's not miss it. Let's not go through the Christian life for 40 years and miss what God is wanting to tell us. What is he telling us? We'll continue to read those verses. This is what God was wanting to say. Verse 5, And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes was not waxen old upon you, and the shoes did not waxen old upon thy feet. You have not eaten bread, neither have you, did you drink any wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. I didn't give you bread. You didn't have bread for 40 years because there was no corn. There was no wheat. There was nothing like that. There were no crops. Did you remember? You didn't have any of that, but you're sustained. You didn't have anything good to drink, but you're sustained. I did all this. I did these miracles in your life every day. I took care of you 40 years, and I took care of you in a way that was absolutely impossible at that day for common man to do. And then it comes down from Heshbon down, and then Moses left them, and he went down to the Jordan River, and he came, he came across the Jordan River now. And look what happens here. And it came to pass that when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn. And then he's, uh, uh, Joshua simply said this, Art thou for us or against us? Verse, four, uh, verse 14, Nay, but the captain of the Lord of hosts I'm now come. The captain was standing over Jericho, and he was protecting Jericho from when Israel will finally, finally reach this. Now remember, 500-some years later after the promise came that they're to occupy this land where the Canaanites were, 500 years later that God waited and waited and waited and waited and waited while they were in Egypt, while they were in the desert, 500 years some later, here they come, and he was standing there waiting somewhere in the heavenlies, somewhere over the city of Jericho. And some of you have seen the city of Jericho, walk right in it. Somewhere suspended there was the captain of the Lord of hosts. And what happens here, Joshua went down and he worshipped him. I believe it was Jesus. Jesus is the captain of the Lord of hosts. I don't think uh, uh, Joshua would have worshipped angels. I believe it was Jesus that he worshipped right there. And then he went in and they overtook the city as you know the story. But before he said that, he said the same thing to Joshua. He said, Joshua, you've been walking for 40 years. You walked for 40 years in the wilderness. Your shoes have never worn out. I want you to take off your shoes. These, this place is now holy ground. This condemned place, listen to this, this condemned place where the Canaanites live, where they occupied against the will of God, God told Abraham, this is going to be your city. 500 years later, God says it's holy ground. Why is it holy ground? Because it's part of the promise. You see, when God promises something, it becomes a holy ground. It becomes a place where you're to take it. But he waited 500 years, 400 to 500 years that he waited. He still pronounced it holy ground. Why? Because it was the promise of God. When God gives you a promise, it's holy. It's for you to receive. He walked with the children of Israel for those 40 years, and they did not perceive what God wanted to show them. He came to the city, and there stands the captain of the Lord of hosts. And he said, Joshua, take off your shoes where you're at is holy. No, no, this, this Jericho cannot be holy. They're worshiping other gods. They're Canaanites after Nimrod and after some of the old ones that were seeking after other gods that came from uh, through the flood. Then it, they went through Nimrod, which was, what was the one before that? Uh, it was Shem, Ham. It was from Ham's lineage. 
The Canaanites were cursed people that then went and lived in these areas. And God spoke to Abraham as he was going down through in that dream. And he said, look, Abraham, when he walked, when the animals were separated and he made the covenant with him, those places, those cities and strongholds of Satan were now called in the eyes of God holy. Not the people, but the promise. I hope you get this point. The promise that God gave for that polluted city to Abram 500 years earlier, now he declares and said, Joshua, take off your feet. It's holy ground. And he was right outside Jericho is what it says. How does that compute in our day? How does that compute to my life tonight? I believe this is what God is saying. All the promises that are in God are yea and amen. And they're all holy now. Because God said it, that makes them holy. There are things and, and ways and cities that we have in our lives at times that seem everything except holy. Places that you have not conquered. Places that I have not conquered. Places that are trials and, and problems in my life. But God has given me a promise to that and given me a promise over that. Therefore, it makes this moment Whatever I'm going through, whatever you're going through, is a time, this is holy ground. Because God made a statement of a promise, and that changed that realm. And in God's eyes, that's what it looks like. The problem is we refuse to take off our shoes, but we continue to walk in our own way, and it does, we cannot conquer it that way. I want to show you the final picture. Hallelujah. Let's look at let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 and look at verse 10. This is what God has been trying and trying and trying to tell the children of Israel. He said, you've walked with me, you've seen the miracles, you've sat right in the middle of them, it affected you. God did marvelous things right with you. But you're still not seeing. You don't get it, Israel. Then he looks to Deuteronomy 30, verse 10. I cut a bunch out, but we're going to close with these scriptures. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Now let's just wait there. Don't read on. Just wait on me a little bit. So what he does, if you go to Deuteronomy 30, I had all the verses, I wanted to read them off. And it looked like a pretty big list of do's and don'ts. And he narrows it down to a certain point here that I believe is the whole point of this whole message. Remember, we have cities that are declared holy by way of a promise. All right? The enemy was still occupying, but God gave a promise. It was declared holy now. Do you see that? I, I, I just think we have to get that. Places that you need to conquer in your life, areas that you need to conquer in your life, that has been devoured by the enemy, but the promise has been given. The promise in the Messiah, the promise in Jesus, the promise of the blood, the promise of forgiveness, these promises have been given makes that evil, ugly city that is nothing but a, a twisted up mess of a lifestyle, makes it a moment of holiness. Not that that is holy, but what God declared. He said, oh, my promise is upon it. Can you receive that promise? Take off your shoes. Now let's just read the next verse. For these commandments, now he gave a bunch, or for this commandment which I command thee this day is not hidden from thee, neither is far off. Let's stop there again. Now let's look at this. Okay. Children of Israel, you don't get it. For 40 years, for 400 years in Egypt, you don't get it. I've done all these things around you, you still don't get it. Now I give you a whole list of commandments. Do you get it now? No? You're just wanting 
to do the commandments. But what I'm wanting to show you is what is next. And this is the whole key and the secret to the Christian life. Now we look at the next verse. Let me go back to 11 again and read that and then continue to tag on to there. For this commandment which I command you this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is far off. This, what I'm commanding of you, it's not far off. It's not hidden. It's right there. Verse 12. It is not in heaven. So don't think once I get to heaven, I'll have it. It's not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who shall go to heaven? Who shall go up to heaven for us and bring it unto us? that we may hear it and do it. Certainly, this is what you're trying to tell us, God, once we get to heaven, we'll see it. No, no, it's not in heaven. It's not up there. It's not sitting here tonight either. It's not in the building. Well, then, where else is it? Well, verse 13, Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us? And to bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. It's not out there. It's not here. It's not over in Israel. It's not in the Pacific Ocean. It's not in a city. It's not anywhere. Well, what is it? But the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Children of Israel, 400 years of slavery, you were the children of promise. I promised you to Abraham. The promises are true. You've walked through Sinai for 40 years. I've done miracles, some of the greatest miracles that I've ever done. Dividing the sea, you walked through it in the middle on dry land. You saw all the miracles I did in the wilderness, but you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. There's only two of them that got it, and that was Joshua and Caleb. Because when they saw the giants... In the Canaanite cities, they looked at the giants and said, but God is greater. But the others all said, oh, they are much greater than us, and we fear them and stirred the whole children of Israel so that they could not believe. Israel, are you thinking correctly here? The problem is your thoughts are not holy, your ways are not holy. But what I have stated and what I have said is holy. It has been separated. It has been separated to my work divinely. Well, where is it? Where can I get a hold of it? It's in your mouth and in your heart. Amen. God, God didn't say, well, I am going to put it in your heart. It is in your heart. Amen. And it's in your mouth. Yes. That's us tonight. It is in our mouth and in our heart. Don't say it's, yeah, it's in Wayne's heart. It belongs to him. He's a preacher. No, no. It's in our heart and in our mouth. So what are you going to do with it? God wanted Israel to be wholly separated from their thoughts, from their ways, so that they could acknowledge the truth of God. Because it was already in them by way of promise. Do you get it? These words are already in us by way of promise, by way of the new birth as well. And look at the last verse. So he says, I conclude. See, I have set before thee this day life and good death and evil. You have chosen death and evil to Israel. Joshua and Caleb chose life and good because they saw God sanctified that word for that purpose. You, you, you see where the problem is with this thinking is we believe it's for salvation but nothing else. Right. We know that we're not forgiven unless we confess our sins. Yeah? So we confess our sins. What about all the other things and all the promises that are? Where does it start? It's in your heart. It's inscribed in you now by regenerate people. He wrote it in your hearts. He put it in there. 
Now, where else is it? How does it come out? How does it start working? It comes from your mouth. We have to say it. But the children of Israel said just the other thing. They were constantly complaining and griping and had problems with everyone else and everything that was going on. Now we're out of water again. Now we've got all this. We'd rather go back and eat garlic and, and all these kinds of things and be out here and die in the wilderness. They were speaking those kinds of things always. Now let me tell you, I have seen the extreme of positive confession type stuff. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the truth of God's Word. The truth of God's Word. What He has spoken, what He has promised, what He said He will do, what He said He is. To believe that and repeat that in the name of Jesus out of our own lips. It's in our heart. He's imputed into us. But we sit here and we wonder and we wonder and we wonder, well, how would I overcome certain things and how would I take this city down? How would I, this city problem that is in my life, this whole city that has been built up in me, these issues that I have in my life, and you say things like, oh, it's just hopeless. Mm -hmm. It'll stay right there. When you see the promise that God has given us promise over these things, because it's in my heart, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do these things. I don't want to commit these sins. It's in my heart not to. Can you start speaking? Can you start speaking what God is saying about it? Can you let it become alive? I have literally seen this happen, where it becomes life when it leaves the mouth. Amen? This is what God wanted to teach the children of Israel all those years. But they missed it. 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 Isn't that something? Isn't this something that they could sit in the midst and see the hand of God and the power of God and still sleep? Miss it at the end. Oh, we're the children of Israel, you know. We're just, yeah, we're, where are we heading? Well, we're going with uh, Joshua. God said, you're missing this whole thing. I've showed you over and over. I want you to be part of it. I have spoken to you. You have it in your heart. And I'm telling you today that are sitting out here in the audience tonight, I'm, want you, I'm wanting you to hear this. God is not speaking to all the others that he's speaking to you. What are you doing with the word that's in your heart? What are you doing with it? Do you believe it? Or do you deny it? Do you rather go back and take the old turtle dove and the nestling and just, just make little ducklings and I just want to make little pigeons and leave me alone? Or does that turn and become sacrificed as well? That was a demand before this, this covenant could spring into being that all the ways of that person had to be separated from mama, the producer in my life. That's how it works. I'm telling you, some of you are struggling and have struggled for many years, and you will continue to struggle till you get a hold of this truth. It's just the way it is. Forty years of struggling, another 40 years. But you get a hold of this truth, and you see that this is what God's saying. The Word is in your heart, and it's in your mouth. It's not overseas. It's not in heaven. And then there's also a verse in Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. It says, uh, no, I have it wrong. I... Maybe I took it out of here. Where it talks about the word of God is neither even in thy heart and in thy mouth, also in the New Testament. So it's speaking to us today the word of faith that we believe, that we preach. Amen. People, let's just not miss it. Let's not miss what God is wanting to do. It's so easy to say, well, it's for somebody else. No, the word of God is neither in your heart. When he says heart, it means in your heart, not somebody else's heart that's sitting with you. It's in your heart. Take the Word of God and believe it and speak it forth in the name of Jesus. Amen? Lord, there's areas in my life that I have not overcome, but I know that there is promises, and I take the promises of God where you have spoken those promises. I take that promise as a promise to apply directly against that city in my life. And I speak to that city and I ask in the name of Jesus, that city will go down. That city will not control my life. The people in that city will not control my life. The peer pressure that comes around it will not control my life. I will be controlled by God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
I will surrender, and I do surrender my life to Christ again. I lay the body parts out apart that the furnace of God, the smoking furnace and the fire can walk right through it and separate my nerve system so where my natural tendencies will not prevail in my life. But that I might walk in truth, believing the word that he already placed in me. I, I, I hope I'm making just a little bit of a, a dinge to your thoughts. Just a little bit. I hope you get just a little bit. Because I, there's some things I'd just rather not say. But let me say this. God has blessed me in many ways. I think you know that. You've seen that. From, from a businessman to, to many things, God has blessed me in many ways. Do you think it just happened? No. Do you think it just happened that God just had so much favor that he decided I'm going to bless him? Do you think maybe there are some principles and some truth that I've been observing and doing that is allowing him to do this? That is exactly, that is exactly the only thing that I can say that my success has come from the Word of God. Amen. The things that He spoke to me, the blessings that He spoke to me, the things that He put in my heart, I let it come out. I, I would really like to speak much plainer to you. I really believe that some of you are struggling that do not need to struggle. There's plenty of word for it. There's plenty of promises. You might say like this, but, but Wayne, was it like this all your life? No. When I saw first what God is trying to do in my life, and I saw that all my success is based on blessing, not smarting, not outsmarting competition, but on blessing of God, when I saw that it is only blessing of God that will bless me, and I saw that it is in my heart and in my tongue to confess, I started doing that. Not to gain personal wealth, and not, not for that reason at all, but for Him to receive glory through things that He can do through a man that only has 8th grade education or ninth grade that flunked the fifth grade. I flunked the fifth grade at 27 Fs in the fifth grade. Flunked it. Had no educational value whatsoever. And when God baptized me with the Holy Spirit, He put wisdom in my life in a way that I never experienced up to that point. And in that wisdom, he showed me his word, and I spoke out of that word. And many, many, many times I said, God, this is against anything I've ever heard, but I see your truth. I'm going to believe it, and I'm going to speak it forth. The day will come when you will bless me. The day will come when you will take care of all my needs. We were so poor at times that we'd have to look for pennies in the, in the sofa just to make ends meet. I mean, my wife can attest to that, how awfully poor we are and how it was completely against anything. People were even laughing. I even had one man say like this, I wouldn't have my pigs live in a place where you have your family. And I take that and I say, God, you're not being glorified in that. God, how can you be glorified in that? Somehow, God, oh, oh, God, open my eyes because it's all before me, but I still don't quite see it. This is how I came to him night after night, year after year, and all at once, one day, on the way home from work, he stopped me in a certain place I can put my finger on. It's less than a mile from here. He stopped me right in my tracks, and he gave me a promise. And on that promise, he said like this, I will, I will um, restore unto you the years that the canker worm and the palm worm has, worm has eaten. And I believe that at that moment, I said, that's a promise of God because the palm worm and the caterpillar and the canker worm were eating away on my finances, were eating away on my life. 
on everything that I was and had. But then he gave me a promise, and I started repeating that to him. I'd say, I will be restored. The years that the palm of worm, where he ate away money from me from out of my pockets, and my pockets had holes. When he took that from me, he will restore the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm. And I continued to repeat that. Oh, yes, you will do that, God. Yes, you will do that. You gave me the promise. And I'd remind him. And I'd remind him. All at once I saw the whole picture started to shift. And I saw God did one major thing in my life. One major thing. And that is when I could bless other people when it was going really well with them. When I saw that somebody was prospering in a way, and I'd say, God bless them for that, and I'd rejoice with them. There's people sitting here tonight, then when you see somebody else it's going better than what it is for you, you cannot rejoice. You become jealous. You become envious. That's not what the Bible is saying here. You don't go by that. You go by the word that he has placed in your heart, and you speak it out of your mouth. When I could rejoice with them that rejoice, the Lord turned my world upside down and he started blessing and blessing and blessing. That's what happened. That's exactly what happened. And I challenge you. You say, it's just because I'm a preacher. No, it's not that. No, it's not that. It's a choice that I made based, and I acted based on a promise that God gave to me. And let me say this, that in Jesus Christ, all the promises of God are yea and amen, and they are in Jesus. Amen. So the promises belong to you. The problem is the condition that we meet to enter into that covenant is where we have to lay our life completely before him. And it has to die completely. Then God will start that resurrection power by way of the Holy Spirit. Because there's a furnace in it and a smoking furnace. And a lamb that is right in the middle of it. And that lamb will illuminate your eyes and you'll be able to see things that you never dreamed of. That was the problem with Israel. They had no lamb that was really with them. They had the light that moved them around. But they, even that, they couldn't see it. May I just ask you this question. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Israel didn't see it. They were right in the midst of it. They walked with it. They enjoyed it. I'm sure they did. They, wow, look at this, what God did again. But they didn't see it. They missed it. Do you see it? Yeah, but it's not for me. It's for somebody else. Oh, no. Well, where? Then go get it. Where is it? It's not overseas. It's not in heaven. It's in your heart. It's in your heart. Now, some of you are immediately thinking, money, money, money. No, no, no. It's not about that. It's about promises. It's about promises. You get your eyes on money promises. There's no promises in that. It's the promises of God. And the promises that God gives, He wants to be glorified by it. There's so many more things I'd love to say, but you know, I, I have my limits, what I can say over the pulpit. This is one thing where I, where I have my limits and I cannot say a whole lot. I know, I can hear some of you thinking, yeah, but Wayne, it's different from me. Oh, no, it's not. It was exactly like that for me, even worse. Amen. Amen. But God put it in my heart. And when I saw the truth, especially when he said to that time, I said, oh, I mean, I, oh, the struggles that I had and the struggles that I had. I, 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 it just looked like, I mean, just the whole world is upside down over top of me and nothing's working. And finally, I, in fact, I, I, uh, I had met several people in the past week and working with him and counseling, but then I also had a visitor in my house that stopped by him and his wife. And I asked a question. I said, I noticed, you know, you used to have a lot of uh, marriage problems right to begin with, but something changed and there's something happening and uh, something's different. Uh, what, what, is, what was the key? What, what was your turning point? And I got the text, and it would be worth it just to read it off. It was something along this, not exact words, but he said once when I could rejoice 
with them that rejoiced, my life started changing. I really want you to hear that. God started blessing my work. He blessed my work. And it, things started going really good for me when I started rejoicing with them that rejoiced. It's a major victory point. I saw the same thing in my life. When I got my eyes off of other people and I rejoiced, rejoiced, rejoiced. You know, I have something on my heart to just share a little bit. I'm going way over here. I, I had no intention to go this far. These little afterthoughts. Some of you are struggling, and I, I understand this. Some of you are struggling with uh, maybe marriage problems. You're sitting here, and you kind of like, I wish my husband would be kind of like so-and-so, or my wife would be like so-and-so. Maybe just uh, like, I wish my husband would be a more of a spiritual leader, or my wife would be, I mean, you name it. Maybe you need to start blessing people, blessing God for marriages that you see are wonderful. And just bless God for those marriages. Lord, I thank you for that marriage. I see how they get along with each other. I see the glory of God upon their faces. I bless you for that. I thank you for that. Start doing something like this and see if it won't make a difference in your marriage. Talk about a marriage on the rocks. That's how I found Jesus. It wouldn't have been for Jesus. My goodness, I would not be here tonight. There's no way. The mess that I was in. But look, Jesus is right for whatever is wrong in your life. It's just simply the way it is. Never limit Jesus. Never limit the power of him. Never limit his presence. Never limit his promises. That's part of being separated unto God. That's part of holiness. Please hear that. That is part of holiness. God has clearly separated his promises and he took them and gave them to the church and he gave them to all the redeemed and he separated it for them for his purpose and for his glory. It's holy. It's holy. The city might still be walls around it and the enemy is in it, but it's been declared holy because it's a promise. <laughs> when I saw that, when I saw that when God declared it a holy place, yet the thing was walled over. And it was still a Canaanite city. He declared it holy because it was based on a promise. Amen. Oh, my. Well, so but then it belonged to God. God wouldn't call anything holy if it wouldn't belong to him. So go and receive it. You, you see, some of you are still saying it's not that simple. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. It just is. And I have to stop. I have to stop. It's the difference between holiness. And when the, in heaven, when they saw God being like that, oh my, he was entirely separated from opinion. He was entirely separated from Satan. There was nothing even closed. There was no shadows overcasting him. There was not an overcast sky today from Satan trying to mess up his plans. There was nothing. He was completely entirely removed from the presence of Satan, completely entirely removed from the presence of his influences and everything. He is completely clear in all his promises, in all his ways, in all his truth. It's completely separated unto him. He is holy, holy, holy. That's him. Amen. Oh, my. One thought. I'll just again confirm this. Remember, if you have a promise, take off your shoes. It's a holy place. If you have a promise, take off your shoes. You can't walk the same way. It's a holy place. Do you hear me? If you have a promise, God gives us promises. See, we believe that for salvation, but for other things we don't. It's no problem. Nobody would ever argue that it doesn't apply to salvation. It's when it gets to other things where we have a problem with, we stumble. We want to say it's for others, but not us. But when it's salvation, yeah, it's a life and death matter. Yep, then it belongs to me. No, all the promises of God are yea and, and amen. That's what they are. Amen. Some of you are struggling in unnecessary ways. It's absolutely not necessary for you to struggle like that. 
You have it in your heart not to, but you don't have it in your mouth. Amen? I speak to you truth. I really want you to be free. I want to see you set free from the things that are wrong in your life because we're children of God. We have the promises. They've been given to us, every last one of them, for all the cities to just meld in the presence of God. It's in your heart, but it's not in your mouth. Don't go through this life spending 30 years with me. Some of you have spent 30 years with me. I've been a leader to some of you for 30 years. And you've been with me and with me. Do you get it? Do you see it? Do you get it? Do you see it? I don't want to go to my grave in another, maybe another 50 years. I'm 60 now. I'll be pretty old. And some of you miss it, sitting here, and you heard this, the stories. You heard, and you saw miracles right with your own eyes. You saw it. You've experienced it. Some of you got healed from stuff. You saw it all, but you're missing it for yourself. It's how I live. It's how I believe. It's the way the Bible says. I've got 100% Bible support for this. Amen. The whole problem so often is I'm not willing to lay my spine apart and allow my nerve system to be declared dead unto God. Separated, laid apart for God to walk right down the middle and change my whole life. That's where it is. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Father, you spoke very clearly to us this evening. And these are New Testament people. We are New Testament people. We're not in the Old Covenant.